Hi, I'm Pastor Dennis Platt. I'm the principal of Vision College, the very best Bible college on or off the internet. But don't take my word for it. Go for yourself and have a look. Visioncolleges.edu.au And there you'll find an incredible range of flexible, affordable Bible college studies which are very legitimate. Bible college studies which have been used to train ministry. They're also used for people who want to satisfy idle curiosity or Christians who want to know the word of God better. Our materials are used for those who are seeking professional development and whether you're looking for accredited or recognised studies, you need look no further than visioncolleges.edu.au or send me an email, principal at visioncolleges.edu. I'd love to be able to explain to you the various resources that we have available. But right now, I'm just a little bit more interested to present to you some more of our series on knowing God's voice. We've just started this series. This is section two of that particular study that we're going to be looking at. And here's the very purpose of this particular uh, study for us, this particular session. If any man will do, he shall know. If any man will do, if any man will do the will of God, he will know my voice. That is the thing that we need to realize. What is this thing about knowing God's voice? It's such a difficult thing to explain sometimes because it's intensely personal. For some people, the voice of God is a still small voice. For some, it's an impression deep in their spirit. For others, there's an audible voice. For some, they find the word of God endorsed and presented to them through the scriptures or through a song, through a sermon, through a myriad of different ways. And some, it's a collection of all of those at different times in different places. But one thing is certain, once you start recognizing the voice of God speaking to you, however it is, you really know that this is God's voice speaking to you. It's important to realize that God wants you to hear his voice. Have a look at this scripture with me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's worthwhile taking a note of that particular scripture because it's going to come up quite a bit in this session, in part and in whole. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, the problem that we face is that sin separates us from God. And if it separates us from God, sin separates us from hearing God's voice and understanding God's will for us. We may get, a, get it in portion, but we're not going to properly understand it. And to understand God's will, we need to understand that there is a process. There are some prerequisites. And one of those prerequisites, of course, is getting to know the word of God, the will of God and doing what you read. These prerequisites begin, first of all, with being born again. And that's absolutely necessary. Here's the principle. In a natural world, you don't recognize the voice of a stranger. If someone who is a stranger is calling out to you in a shopping mall or down the street, you would continue to walk away from them until perhaps their voice became so loud that you turned around, not because they're calling you, but because the voice was so profoundly loud. But we don't recognize the voice of a stranger. But for those that we know and love, even in a tumultuous crowd, the voice of our mother, our father, our brother, our sister, our son, our daughter, cuts across the tumult and we distinctly hear that voice because of familiarity and an intimate relationship that we have with God or with that person, I should say, at that particular time. That key verse that we're using, 
Romans 12 verse 1 requires us to make a move towards God and this is so necessary because you see the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but he's long suffering to us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance God desires for us to come into his presence he desires for us to make begin a relationship with him and this is so powerfully enforced for each and every one of us in john 3 16 as jesus began or the whole of john chapter 3 as jesus is talking to nicodemus and he says to him you must be born again and indeed we must and the reason that we have to be born again is that because we are sinful beings We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and we're all separated. But God doesn't want us to leave us that way. God wants to do something about that. He wants us to recognize something. And he wants us to recognize that sin has a penalty. That penalty is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. And that's so important. The beginning of hearing God's will starts with this very idea of hearing what the word of God has to say. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. If we confess sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We sort of need to get this whole idea here that Jesus recognizes that God recognizes that we are sinful beings and that sin attracts death. But at the same time, he wants us to recognize that, to accept him and to come into his presence to make the move to him. And then we see this thing, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. The beginning of a relationship with God begins with having everlasting life, begins with being born again. When we present our gods in this manner, we're born again. We become, the Bible says, a new creation. The old life is gone. And you have the opportunity of starting a life which is going to hear the word of God. You begin to know the word of God by being born again. You begin to know the will of God by being born again. You cannot make it work the other way around. We cannot start by knowing God's will we have to start by getting to know God and it's a trust thing we make a step to him but then he moves back to us so being born again that is the first step but then there's a second step that's required and that is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit this 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 experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit has experienced first on the day of Pentecost with the disciples and has been passed down through generations and generations to come that the Holy Spirit will dwell within each and every individual he he takes residence in every Christian regardless of being baptized in the Holy Spirit but once you are baptized in the Holy Spirit then you start to become so much more sensitive to what the Holy Spirit has to say to you in the very different ways he come he says that when the spirit of truth is come he will guide you and lead you in all things concerning God that's the beginning of the knowing the word of God and it's so incredibly important let's have a look at what this is saying to us as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God and we need to understand that if we are led by the spirit of God we are the sons of God and it's an important thing to understand you see the natural man a man who is not born again cannot receive and understand the things of God he can't hear the word of God he can't hear the spirit of God he can't hear the the the, the will of God he cannot they are foolishness to him and he cannot know them because the will of God is spiritually discerned if you're not born again you cannot know the will of God 
if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are restrained in learning and understanding the will of God. So it's incumbent upon us to choose to allow ourselves to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it makes such a big difference. You see, we're just three quick examples. If we have a, a quick look here to a situation with one of the early disciples, Philip, a deacon led by the Spirit of God to join a chariot that he saw on the desert road to Gaza. The Spirit said to Philip, go near, overtake this. And a, a conversation continues between Philip and the eunuch that's on the chariot and in the end this man is baptized in the Holy Spirit he's saved he comes into an eternal relationship with God because Philip baptized in the Holy Spirit born again was able to hear what the Word of God had to say and he was able to respond to that and then we see also a second option where Peter is told by the Holy Spirit to go to three men who came from Caesarea. He says, go with them, do not doubt. The Spirit spoke to him. He spoke to him in a dream. Go with them, do not doubt. Peter recognizes the leading of the Spirit and he has no doubt. You see, yes, Peter had walked with Jesus, knew Jesus, he'd been experienced. But that's the point, isn't it? We need to be a people who gain experience in the Word of God, experience in front of God, so that we can hear what God has to say to us. We need experience. And that's the thing that happens with Peter. He hears the, the, the Holy Spirit. He goes to Caesarea. And as a result of that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given to the Gentile church. If you're not a Jew, you are a direct result of Peter's discussion at the, right there at Caesarea. If Peter hadn't listened to the Spirit of God, you and I may not be Christians today. Spiritual maturity. This is the next caveat that we need to have a look at the next precondition when a child is born they have to attain a certain level of spiritual maturity in order that they might be able to grow and recognize the point voice of their parents now it's true that whilst the child is in the womb it hears and gets to know the voice of the parents but when the child is born he has to learn that child has to learn to associate the voice they heard in the womb was the person speaking to them now. And there is a need for you and I as we're born again. We may well have been hearing God's word but not recognizing it. But now once we're born again, we get to be able to associate that still small voice, that urging of the spirit with Jesus himself. The spiritual maturity begins and has to develop in order for you and I to be able to function properly according to the Spirit of God. This spiritual maturity comes about from this particular scripture here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's the thing. I have to be transformed. The Holy Spirit is a transforming agent. He will change me. But there's a relationship that's required here. That transformation isn't going to happen because you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and God waves a magic wand and suddenly you're doing as you are commanded. It doesn't work that way. There is an act of relationship between you, me and the Holy Spirit that changes who I am into the image of Christ and that is a transformation of the mind and I have to understand just how important this transformation really is and how important this spiritual maturity has to be for every one of us. Let's have a look at what Hebrews has to say about this spiritual maturity. He says, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good 
and evil. And isn't that true in life, that as we grow, our senses are exercised to know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, good and harm. Our senses are exercised. We know not to touch the heater because it burns, not to step out into the street because of the vehicle. We know and understand the difference between cold and hot. And we respond to these things and we grow in maturity. Well, so it needs to be in the word of God if we're going to really get to know God and if we're going to know his will and we're going to do the things he created us for. We have to be mature, we have to grow, we have to understand that this is a necessary thing for each and every one of us. Everyone who is going to grow in Christ has to understand that we have to choose to be spiritually mature. But you know there's something else, you know, spiritual maturity brings about emotional maturity as well it's not just a spiritual thing this thing of spiritual maturity is a whole of person benefit if we lack emotional maturity you know a lot of the decisions that we make may well be irrational out of anger self-control or impulse and that can often lead to disastrous long-range results for all of us but as we mature more and more into the Spirit of God, we find that the fruit of the Spirit begins to affect us as well. And the fruit of the Spirit helps us in so many areas of our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, kindness, temperance. Against such there is no law. But those attributes applied to our lives help us in our human emotions and reactions and decision making as well as developing us and to mature us to become more and more like Jesus as the days go by. And so this brings us to the next point which is transformation and each of us needs to be transformed. See what it says, do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So spiritual maturity leads to transformation, another prerequisite that will enable you to know the voice of God. What natural man, human nature desires to do and what God desires for your life is very different and it creates a conflict between the flesh, the natural man and the spiritual man. And every single one of us is aware of that conflict. Paul was aware of it. You and I are aware of it. Every Christian is aware of the conflict between the natural man and the spiritual man. This tension is brought about because, again, because of sin and because of our sin nature. Now, yes, when I'm born again, I'm given a new nature. But we, each and every one of us, knows that there is this constant struggle between right and wrong occurring for each and every one of us. This tension is very real. Paul addresses it for us and helps us to understand a little bit. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish to do. They are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish to do. And that is so true. Even Paul himself said, there are times I do the things I don't want to do. And there are times that I do the things I want to do. How do I deal with this? First of all, let's realize this is normal human Christian experience that you are not alone in your struggle. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Everybody out there suffers what you're suffering one way or another. They may not all have the same temptation you have, but they all suffer temptation. And you may not suffer the same temptation as someone else, but we're all facing this struggle. So again, we're brought back to this same scripture that we need to, as Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove you have to be willing to be transformed 
and changed into the image of Christ, which is or should be the goal of every Christian, that we might be what Jesus called us to be, what he wants us to be. It's not easy. You know, we, we hesitate to surrender because we don't understand what God's will is for us. But, you know, God's will for you and for me is always good. There's a scripture in Isaiah that's certainly well worth looking at. Let's, let's turn to that now. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to give you, a f uh, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So many people today live without hope, without future, without a sense of good. And yet to turn to Christ and to be transformed, to allow that transformation with the confidence that this transformation is going to bring about a change in who I am and a change in what is going to happen to me today, next week, next year. God only has good plans for you. You may not have experienced them, but perhaps that's because you've not been allowing your mind to be transformed the way it ought to be. You've not been allowing God to make the changes that you need to be made. Paul goes on to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this. That is a choice of will for each and every one of us. We choose to allow this to happen. God says, I will put my law in your mind. In Hebrews 8 verse 10, I will put my laws in your mind. But we have to respond to those laws. And you feel them, you know it. I mean, it's amazing. People get born again and suddenly they know right from wrong in areas they never understood. That is because the Holy Spirit of God is resident within you and speaking with you and urging you. And suddenly you realize that this thing which you've been doing for so long is not acceptable after all. Because the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And now you have a choice as the tension between doing what is right and doing what is wrong presents itself. And you might not know the Bible verses. You might not be able to quote chapter and verse. You might not have anything more than a feeling. But you know it's from God and it's begun the process of speaking to you. And so we have to respond to that. But the problem is we have a vivid and active imagination. And that vivid and active imagination is striving to make you, cause you to renew your mind. Cast down arguments and everything that presents itself, says the scripture. Let's just have a look at that scripture there. Cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captive. See, that is how you do this it's how you allow your mind to be removed you make a choice you go with the imagination or you go with what is real you go with God or you go with something else but you have to make the choice I have to make that choice to do what God wants me to do or not to do it and there are consequences either way the things to think about. What should I meditate? Well, the imagination is very real, but yeah, so is the solution. Because let's have a look at something Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, whatever things are pure, whatever is lovely, if it's of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And if you do, we have the mind of Christ. And I want to tell you something. Meditating on these good things isn't simply a matter of meditating on what the Bible has to say. Of course it will include that. But anything that is good, good music, good literature, good art, good food, good exercise, good anything. Take your time to be entertained by good and not evil. Take your time to meditate on things that are going to nurture you. 
And as this happens, as my mind is being renewed, I'm going to be able to hear and understand and recognize the word of God for me in my circumstance, in my time, in my situation where I need that the most. It is a guaranteed formula for success. But it's a choice that I have to make. And so we come to this section on proving God's will. We have a chart that's going to help us to understand what it is that we need to do based on that single verse in Romans. The chart summarizes this process of dealing with the prerequisites that we need to deal with in order to recognize what it is that God wants us to do. Let's have a look at this chart. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that means that you come to God through his mercy, extended through the sacrifice of Jesus for your sins. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. It means I come to God through his mercy, not through anything that I've done. I have to begin by trusting in Jesus. I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. See, that's going to bring about the spiritual maturity enabled by the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. The spiritual maturity cannot come without presenting myself, making decisions and sacrifices of life, of allowing myself to be changed. So I beseech you present your bodies and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation by the word, the renewing of the mind. I need to allow my mind to be renewed because if I don't allow my mind to be renewed, I can't grow, I can't be mature, I, I can't see transformation. All those things that I need are simply not going to happen if I don't accept the fact of the matter. Proving God's will is a matter of new birth experience. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, spiritual maturity, the transformation of the mind. How do these things relate to the will of God? Well, it all comes back to proving the good and acceptable and perfect will of God by submitting and allowing your mind to be transformed. That word, prove. It means to determine, to confirm, to be sure of something. These prerequisites lead us to that assurance, but we've got to be willing to do it. What exactly is meant, though, by the will of God? Well, for each and every one of us, that's going to be different. Knowing the will of God for us? God's will for me is different for you. God's will for you is different for your neighbor, your husband, your wife, your brother, or anyone else. We all have been created as a perfect, complete, unique individual. And God wants you to find the best for you in your life. God wants you to know that you are incredibly valuable. God wants you to know right now that you matter and you matter greatly to him. You matter so much that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, that if you would believe him, if you would accept what he says, if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. And in that process, you will get to know the will of God. You will get to recognize the word of God. You will get to recognize the spirit of God. You will get to recognize God's will for you and hey you might get to make a change in the world you'll certainly change the world in which you live and some get to change a much broader world you've been called by God for something special but you need to hear it you need to know it you need to let your mind be transformed that can only happen after you've been born again and you need to learn to mature in him. This particular series that we've been dealing with 
this vision colleges subject knowing god's voice by vision colleges and of course you can get hold of that from us at vision colleges visioncolleges.edu.au go to our study streams or send me an email principal at visioncolleges.edu.au and say pastor how can i get to know all about knowing god's voice well here's the details to get hold of me principal at visioncolleges.edu.au go to the website but till this time next time i just pray that god is going to bless you real good as you take some time to get to know all about knowing god's voice if any man will do he shall know